Good morning, good morning. How is everybody this morning? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. All right, let's have a little spirit here. Who has a mimosa? All right. Let's toast to UB. All right, good for us. Everybody. I'm Laura Scandera Trombley, and I'm the 10th president of the University, University of Bridgeport, and I'm thrilled to be here. We are having a fantastic reunion. We already have doubled the size of last year's attendance. I'm very, very happy about that. The weather is holding. We had a great spirit rally last night. And my son, who saw a little bit of the social media, called me and said, I told you to never dance in public, and you have to stop that immediately. Ah, well. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming today, all of our alumni. I see some of our students here today, our student leadership. We are going to have a lot of fun today, lots and lots of activities for all of you. And I thought we would just start with a quick little video of some of the things that we've been doing since the beginning of this year. So, let's go ahead. We have students here, we have faculty here, we have staff members, Thank you. our university president is here, our alumni are here, our co-chair of our alumni board is here, we want to name. I like that. If you can't swim, it's probably not a good day to try. <laughs> That was our first annual plunge, and we had all of our first year students with us, and what was really great about that was the news uh, went out, and I started to hear from faculty and staff whether they could plunge too. And we said, absolutely, everybody can come and take the plunge. We have one of the most beautiful locations in all of higher education, and it's time that we start embracing that a little bit more. So for all of you who are watching saying, I wish I was there, Here's the good news. You can come and plunge with us next year. And the great part about plunging into the Long Island Sound is that you have to run approximately 200 yards before the water gets over your knees. So it may be the safest plunge that you can ever do. It was great spirit. And actually, uh, Carol Papp, who is our dean for health professional, um, she has volunteered to ride her horse through the waves next year when we're all plunging. So that's something to look forward to. Well, I have some great news to share with you today, and I have a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation just to give you a sense of all of the wonderful things that are happening here and the momentum that we have and also how you can be part of all of this. So I thought I would start first with admissions and our marketing and the ways in which we're going to try and reach out to you. First, we will be introducing a brand new website for all of you at the end of this month. It has been under design for quite some time, and it will be reflecting the three colleges of the university. It will be giving us a showcase for all of our student and faculty achievements, and also it will be a much more student-friendly website for prospective students and their parents so they can get more, much more information about the university up front than they've had previously. We also have uh, a UB app that we're going to be unveiling because uh, you may have noticed that most 18 through 22 year olds come with something lodged permanently in their hand that they constantly are checking and some of them actually may be recording me right now as I speak, who can say? I see you out there. And what we want to do is give them the University of Bridgeport in the palm of their hand so they can order books, they can order food, they can work with their advisor to register for classes so all of the policies of the university will be instantly available to them. 
and particularly for first year students and their parents, all of the forms that they have to fill out will be right there. And they won't have to ever worry about losing that crucial housing form that will give them the room that they want. So these are some of the things that we're doing. We are also going to have more frequent, what I call touch points with you. You will be hearing much, much more about us in the future on a weekly basis. We're hiring a videographer. We're going to give you a lot of great moments uh, as we go through the year. You will be getting text blasts from us. And we are going to be encouraging you to come back on a much more frequent basis and all of our uh, outreach is going to try and solidify the tie that binds all of us. Then, as you can see here, we have one of the most, if not in the, t I think at this point we're thinking we are the third most diverse university in the United States. And that is an extraordinary achievement when it comes to private universities. And that, in my view, is absolutely our greatest strength, is our diversity. We have an amazingly diverse campus. We have uh, a wonderful mix of domestic students, and we have a great tradition of welcoming international students to the campus as well. Now, we are going to be continuing our outreach for talented students, both domestically and internationally. We're also going to be, so to speak, expanding our market. Clearly, we are a regional university. Most of our students come from the areas of Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. However, we are going to go national and also, what we're going to be looking to do, because the demographics are pointing us in this direction, is to attract more non-traditional students. That means older students, adult students. We have incredible programs, particularly on our, uh, with our online programs, and we welcome non-traditionals, and that's who's going to be coming back to school in the greatest number over the next 10 years. Just an interesting fact, after 2007, 2008, the Great Recession, the birth rate in the United States dropped 15%. And so the usual number of high school graduates simply isn't there. So we have to think very strategically about where we are going to go for our next generation of proud University of Bridgeport alumni. We have marketing materials that we are developing that we will be sharing with you as well as with donors and foundations. And they are going to draw upon our areas of excellence. And that includes faculty excellence. Without question, the reason why we're all standing here, the, why, the reason why we're all gathered here today, is because of the excellence of our faculty. And we are going to start promoting that and sharing more and more what makes our faculty so unique and giving you a sense of who they are, not just as teachers, but as scholars. We're also going to be talking about our great diversity in addition, we want to emphasize our civic engagement, and that's actually an area where we want to see a great deal of growth. We have many, many community programs, particularly within the city of Bridgeport, and I think it's important for every single one of our students to have a deep and valued experience when it comes to civic engagement so they continue to develop their sense of social responsibility. And we're currently redesigning our orientation program for incoming students. So right at the very start, they can have a great experience working with one of our community partners and really get the sense of what it means to be in a partnership with Connecticut's largest city of about 150,000 people. Let's talk a little bit about retention. Uh, here we have a sense of just what's coming towards us uh, over the next several years. I thought this was a really interesting statistic that the uh, Fairfield Regional Business Council uh, gave me, which talks a little bit about the kind of development that we can expect to see in this area uh, over the next several years. Uh, there is a New York corridor that is coming up this coast. When I first visited, this campus in, I think it was February, so it was a little brisk outside. Uh, what struck me immediately was 
the incredible people that I met, but also the amazing location of the institution. Uh, I don't know of any other institution that has a more beautiful footprint than the University of Bridgeport. And I went to Pepperdine in Malibu, and it's better here, okay? This is the new Malibu, in my view. Thank you very much. All right, that's where we're headed. <laughs> And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, so this is a university that is founded and it is uh, on the south side. You have the Long Island Sound right in front of it. You have a three mile long Frederick Olmsted design park, right? So he kind of, you know, came to Bridgeport before he decided to create Central Park in New York City. Uh, you have incredible transportation and coming from Southern California where mass transportation is yet still a dream for us. Uh, you have a train that can get you to Grand Central Station in 74 minutes. Uh, this is such an extraordinary place where incredible things can happen. And again, coming from Southern California, when it comes to the coast, there's only so much coastline. And everyone is going to find you at some point in time. It's not weather, it's a question of when. And there is a lot of great positive movement right now in the city of Bridgeport that is going to positively affect us. And the time for us is now to take advantage of all of that energy that is coming to this area. Uh, then talking about retention, student retention, which is absolutely key for us because what we want is we want students to come here to have a great undergraduate or graduate experience, form the ties that bind, have a faculty mentor that changes their life the same way that my faculty me me mentors changed mine, and to continue to want to be part of this great institution. So here we have some of the great facilities that you can see when you visit, which you know well, including the wild turkeys that roam campus. And then we have an amazing student here who has managed to channel grief into artistic expression. And our students are our gift from parents. Uh, and we have remarkably talented students who come here. Now, what we want to see here in terms of our retention is we have to create more and more a student-centered campus. Now, I've been in frequent conversation with students since I've been here, and students are great because they are my best advisors, and they give me a lot of advice, hours of advice about what we should be doing here. So some of the things that we need to do, which has become very clear to me, is we have to constantly think about building community for students, in, and that translates into a number of different things, whether it is to create cozy, happy community spaces that are intimate, whether it's creating uh, and doing improvements in the Wheeler Recreation Center. It also includes having more activities for students to do at night, more opportunities for students to become engaged in uh, volunteer opportunities. This is all about keeping our students here and making sure that they can take advantage of the great educational opportunities that we offer. All right. One of the ways that we're going to do this is, I know what you're saying, she's talking about the scooters again. Uh, we're going to, probably by the end of this month, welcome Bird to our campus. Uh, who in here knows what I'm talking about? Okay, all right, good, okay, this is good. You know, I'm glad to see that some people of my generation actually know what this, is, what this means. Uh, I'll tell you just a quick story about Bird. I, before I moved here in June, uh, I was going out to dinner in Santa Monica, and I took my son with me, who's my own focus group, because he's 22 years old and a college student. And I saw a lot of electric scooters on the street, and I said to him, what is the deal with all of these scooters? And he gave me one of those, you're so out of it, mom looks. Oh my God, you don't know about these things? And uh, this is kind of a revolution that's taking place right now. Uh, the deal with Bird is that they will come to campus uh, at no cost to us. They will have what they call bird nests, where they will clump together scooters all over our campus. Students download the app, because everything in life now is related to an app. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And the company will give us 
100 free helmets for our students, and then the cost of the helmets are about a dollar each. Uh, and students will wave the app over the scooter. The scooter will come to life. It costs a dollar for a ride and 20 cents every minute after that. The average ride is about seven to eight minutes. So I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the three-mile park that's right in front of us on a road that already has bike lanes. I've already talked to students who are complaining about the fact, particularly the athletes, which I find interesting, that they live over here and they have to work out over there. <laughs> I say, but this is great, it's part of your training. Actually, no, not when it's at six o'clock in the morning. And this is a way, our campus, as you all know, is kind of long, right, and it's somewhat narrow. Uh, so this is actually an ideal place to do this. What makes the bird attractive is that, A, it's fun. I've already seen our vice president for facilities, George Estrada, practicing on a bird. Uh, also, it is very inexpensive, and here's the genius part of it. You can leave it anywhere you like, anywhere you like. There are no bird racks. There's no storage for the birds. We don't have to maintain the birds. So what does that mean? It means that every night there are going to be individuals who will be making up to $600 a week who will be charging the birds. And you will go around and you'll gather them up. You'll take them home. You'll charge them in the morning. You'll put them back out into the bird nests. And if you're a student on campus and you need to grab a quick, quick ride on your app, there's a built-in GPS that will even tell you how much power the bird has, and you can reserve it for yourself. So it's a quick and easy and fun way to get around. And you might be wondering, well, what are we going to do in February? Well, we're not going to be riding electric scooters. What we will do is we are going to be the first pilot university in Connecticut for this. And we're going to refine and see just how well it works. Then when the t weather turns, we'll gather all up gather all the birds, uh, put them in storage, and then when spring comes, we're going to break them out and make those available for students again. So we're a pilot project. It's going to be interesting. But I wanted to have something for students that was quick, it was easy, it was fun, and it also would not only help them when they travel around campus, but they would also be able to go and enjoy a little bit of this extraordinary place where they live. So that is on the way. Uh, and then I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Bridgeport plan. And we have a great description here about the plan. So one of the questions that I have frequently from parents, not so much students, but parents, is really it's an ROI question. So what is the return on investment when my student goes to college? What does this mean? And the Bridgeport plan is intended to make everything that we do absolutely transparent to both parents and students. So when you come in, and we're planning to actually give it a physical location on the fifth floor of Waldstrom, when you walk in, you're going to be greeted by testimonials from people who are in this room, alumni, talking about your major, what you do now, and how did the work that you did here help prepare you for your career after your time at the university was concluded. Because one of the things that I hear from parents, and particularly with the rise of STEM, is if my child comes here and graduates in four years, what kind of a career are they going to have? What kind of possibilities are they going to have? Are they going to be able to not live with me after they come, <laughs> after they graduate from, from university? Are they going to be able to afford a home? Are they going to have health insurance? Are they going to be able to have a family? Absolutely the right questions to ask. And there is a sense that STEM is a better way, perhaps, a, a little bit more stable way, or health sciences, to prepare students for life after college. There's a little more stability in there that, that uh, there's a clearer career path. But one of the things that I have seen in the 30-some years that I've been involved in higher education is that this idea that there are pre-professional programs, and then you have the arts and sciences over here, um, this really is largely a myth uh, that everything that we do here is, in fact,
pre-vocational. Some of it is a little bit more transparent than other majors. Um, but I can tell you, as a former English and Humanities major, um, I was the only person in my class who actually taught. No one else, no other English major that I went to school with wound up teaching. And I'll hear from parents a lot about, well, what about the lifetime income that my child can expect from this? So when you look at all of the majors that we have, which one do you think actually earns the most money over the course of a person's lifetime? I'm sorry? Engineering? No. Health sciences? No. You're getting closer. English, uh-huh, uh-huh. That's why we all take English. There you go. Uh, why? Because you learn how to, how to write, research, and you can engage in constant critical thinking. And it also allows you to change your career. Because one of the things that we are looking at for this generation of students is that they are not going to go and work for GE, just saying and then in 25 years, stop working for GE. In fact, we are training our students for careers that don't even exist yet. The job titles haven't been invented. The actual career hasn't been invented. Now, that doesn't mean that your student isn't going to have an amazing, wonderful life if they are an engineering student. I am the mother of an engineering student. I'm very proud that he is an engineering student. He's so engineering, he's computer engineering, he's electrical engineering, engineering, he engineers the TV, he showed me how the car worked. It's great having an engineering student as your child. Um, but this idea that there is strength in certain majors and other majors are not so strong is just a myth. So it's to give parents a better sense walking in and also connecting them with your stories about what happened at this great university that helped you move into the next part of your life. Also, we're going to have all of the opportunities that we have available for students right there on one floor in one area that will have great interactive um, technology. It will have cozy furniture. It will probably have food because I found that if you have food or mimosas, people will come. Uh, so they will learn about career services, about internships, about civic engagement. We're going to have a life lessons program there so students can learn how to buy a car uh, and have it financed the right way, how to rent their first apartment, what does it mean to put away money for retirement and how to do that. These are all of the life lessons that students ask me. I have a great education, but I don't know how, to, how does a mortgage work. All right, these are ways in which also you can be involved because I want you to actually come and give our students life lessons. So the Bridgeport plan is very exciting. You will hear more about it. Uh, we are going to start it this coming fall, a year from now. That is when our students are going to start having that available to them. Uh, and that is also when we're going to start having our admissions work with students who are interested in coming to the University of Bridgeport. Then. Faculty, our faculty changes lives every single day. There is absolutely no question in my mind, and that's one of the reasons that I found the University of Bridgeport so extraordinary, is that we have faculty who are here because they care about working with young people and non-traditional students. In fact, I had a young man tell me, this year that he was a, uh, a student in our bridge program over the summer. And he said, you know, I met a faculty member in that program. He is the most important person I have ever met in my life. He's the reason why I'm here. He is the reason why I'm succeeding. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. Because when I was a student at Pepperdine University, a hundred million years ago, I met an English professor who absolutely changed my life. He actually convinced me that I could go to graduate school. We used to have arguments about it. I was arguing I couldn't, if you can imagine. No, that's too much for me. And he said, yes, it isn't too much for you. I'm going to make you fill out those forms. You are going to go on and have a life and have a career. That's what the faculty do here at the University of Bridgeport. In addition, they have incredible opportunities for students to 
become involved in the research that they do. Uh, we have students who basically live in engineering. I don't think Tarek, the dean of engineering, really ever lets them out much. He just captures them and they're there with 3D printers and they're creating robots and doing projects that get sent to NASA that go into outer space. Uh, so we are here to create not just conceptual learning for students, but hands-on learning for students. And that's exactly what they do in our health sciences programs every single day. They take what is learned in the classroom and they apply it and they use their skills to change people's lives. Not just their own, but everyone else's as well. So, here are just a few of the academic achievements that our faculty have accomplished. Um, one of the things that I've asked the provost and the deans to work on this year is our faculty have heavy teaching loads. Uh, in some cases, faculty teach in excess of eight classes a year. Some teach 10. Then they also have responsibilities like community service on campus. They help with advising and they have a heavy advising load. They do independent studies. So I've asked the deans uh, to work with faculty to try and rethink faculty load so that faculty may not have as many course preparations, but they will have more time to spend with students and have conversations with students and be able to take students out for coffee, to be able to hang around and just have a ca casual conversation with students. Because what I hear from alums and what I hear from our students, it's those times that matter when you actually can have a moment and interact person to person and have a chance for that faculty member to get to learn who you are a little bit more than certainly they would if they only saw you in class. Uh, in addition, we're going to be doing salary studies because we have to actually start addressing some of the salary inequities that exist right now on the part of our faculty. We recruit wonderful faculty and we want them to stay here. And so we are going to be addressing that issue. One of the things also that I've heard from students and that I'm aware of is that we have a large number of adjunct faculty on campus. What I want to do is to try and decrease the number of adjunct faculty add more tenure track and full-time faculty because those faculty are the heart of the institution. And I'm gonna guess that they're the reason why most of the alumni come back because they have a great memory of faculty and they also found a friends community here. And that's what creates the emotional bond. And so we want to absolutely continue that and to make it even better. Then, we see new programs that uh, our faculty create. And so one of the things that we have here is a, a rising population of bees on campus. But we have all kinds of projects like this that are interesting, that involve students, uh, that are taking advantage of our particular location. Then, advancement, one of my favorite subjects. Uh, I love fundraising. I like to put the fun in fundraising, as a matter of fact. Um, we have uh, a great heart, a great spirit here, and we have a great advancement team as well. We have had already several different kinds of fundraising activities, uh, and the year is just, I think, about you know, 30, 30 or 40 days long. Uh, we had a golf tournament at the beginning of this year where, see, that's me playing golf. And that's like the best I can play golf. It's, I play the best golf when I don't touch golf clubs. Once I start touching the clubs, it all goes downhill. Uh, but, you know, I'm out there because 150 sponsors were out there and we raised nearly $100,000 uh, for student athletics here and to make improvements. Thank you. and to make improvements in the Wheeler Recreation Center. Uh, and we had a wonderful uh, show of UB Pride on the part of alumni and our business partners. And I just want to say, Anthony, uh, stand up. He's uh, our athletic director, and he did a great job getting everybody there. I think now what we ought to do is next year start a contest. Every time you whiff a ball, you have to pay 10 bucks because you'd make about $1,000 for me. Um, 
We also just saw our Board of Trustees come together to honor the late Frank Zulo, who was uh, our board chair for about 20 years here. And they raised over, their goal was $50,000. They raised about $52,000. They went over goal. And this is to uh, honor a student who exhibits a great spirit of community service and civic engagement. And we have just finished raising that money, and we have just actually named our first Zulu scholar. So we're very, very happy about that. And as you can see, as you're walking around campus, we have the Bauer Innovation Center that is coming back to life. It's one of those wonderful Gilded Age dream fantasy homes that was built right at the turn of the century. And the gift was $2.3 million. And the Innovation Center will be open this spring. And uh, it is going to absolutely be one of the focal points of our campus. And that is coming from a gift from a devoted alum. And then moving on, we have, you know, <laughs> this is hilarious. So I'm walking around campus with George Estrada, because he knows everything, and everyone within a 150-mile radius. And he's taking me through the buildings, and we go into the ground floor of this building, and there's this locked door, you know, and it looks like Al Capone's vault or something. And he said, well, that's where the bowling alley is. I said, the bowling alley? You have a bowling alley? He said, not just a bowling alley. Seven lane bowling alley. He said, it's been closed for decades. No one's gone in there. And he said, it'd be great if we could bring it back. I said, we have to bring it back. This is a bowling kind of place. Just from your reaction, I, I've never met so many people excited about bowling. Uh, so as it happens, we had our first board meeting yesterday. And who knew one of our new trustees builds bowling alleys? I kid you not. I said, all right, you are my new best friend. Come on over here. So he's going to start working with us. He doesn't know this yet, but he's going to be an angel investor. Shh, don't tell him. Let me surprise him. And then what we're going to do is some crowdfunding so we can get that thing up and running and make that part of our students' lives, part of alumni reunion, and we can have bowling leads. And so let's get excited about bowling. All right. Here we go. <laughs> You got a credit for bowling? Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, a bowling major. Okay, I can see it coming. Okay, facilities and appeal. This is what I'm talking about. Look at this place. Look how gorgeous this campus is. We now have the most beautiful baseball diamond in all of higher education. Absolutely. <laughs> Let's be proud of that. Unbelievable. And this is what I want us to think about when we think about our future. We want to think about people. We want to think about our excellence, our pride. We also want to take advantage of this beautiful physical surrounding where we are. And here's what I want you to do. And this is what I want particularly for our alumni to think about. First, support the annual fund. Why? Because it goes to students that give me hope every single day. Every day. Our students are absolutely the best of what we do. So you give for the students through the annual fund. I don't care how much you give. It's not about that. It's about creating community, collaborating, and overcoming. And that's how you do it. It's through the annual fund. The other thing that you can do is and this is where our advancement people are going to find you while you're here today, is you can volunteer to be a mentor for one of our students, for one of our students to come in and job shadow you, for one of our students to come in and do an internship with you. This is incredibly important. What we have to do here is we have to build that network for our students because life is hard. You want to have as big of a network as you can. You want to have a community, friends you can rely upon, and that group is in this room. And our students want to talk to you. If you have a business, if you are in a particular profession, they want to know, how did you manage to do this? 
your advice means a great deal to our students. So you can figure out just how much you want to be involved, whether it's a phone call, cup of coffee, job shadowing, an internship, it's all up to you. But be involved because there is nothing that feels better than helping young people attain their dreams. So I'm here, I am incredibly happy to be here. I'm enormously proud of this place. And we're gonna set this place on fire over the next five to 10 years. So thank you all for coming here today. Thank you. All right. All right. And I'll see you all at the uh, beer garden later on today. <laughs>